So today we're going to be looking at task one for the general training module. If you're doing the academic module, you might not find this class very helpful, but at the same time, it could be a good way to just practice your English regardless. Everybody needs to write letters and emails uh, throughout their lives, so it's a good way to get some practice in. But we won't be looking at any task two today, so we're not going to be doing any essay writing. In March's class, we'll look at the academic task one, so it's going to be another couple of months before we look at another essay class. Okay, let's have a look at this here and then we can think about uh, getting started. So let's read this out first of all. A friend of yours is thinking of going for a camping holiday for the first time this summer. He or she has asked for your advice. Write a letter to your friend in your letter. Explain why you think your friend would enjoy a camping holiday. Describe some possible disadvantages and say whether you would like to go camping with your friend this summer. This is a relatively recent question. It appears in the IELTS Cambridge book uh, for IELTS 15, so relatively recent. But the first thing that we want to think about, or a couple of the first things we want to think about, what are they? What, what, what's one of the first considerations we should be thinking about before we think about planning. Letter type, says Egerman and Hanana. So yes, definitely, and Julius as well. Are we looking at a formal letter? Are we looking at an informal letter? Are we somewhere in between? Um, it's good, it's important to mention that it's not it aren't distinct categories all the time. So, you know, you've got this informal, semi-formal and formal, but it's not, it's more of a sliding scale rather than you're either in one or the other or the other. So sometimes you'll have one that's between uh, semi-formal and formal, sometimes between semi-formal and informal. This is where the tone can get very tricky, um, but you've got to trust your instinct a little bit here as well. And there is some wiggle room because different cultures treat certain things in different ways as well. But with this one, this letter should be pretty clear. What sort of letter is this? What tone should we be adopting? Yes, it's an informal letter. I don't think there's any confusion about this here. Some really uh, easy keywords to, to pick out. Well, one really easy keyword to pick out, which is the word friend, of course. And of course, you've got the write a letter to your friend. So once we've got that out the way, it can also be good to think about the purpose of the letter. So what, are, what is the purpose of this letter? Are we, are we writing to say sorry? Are we writing to say thank you? What are we doing with this letter? Yeah, I mean, as Chaitanya's put there, very clear, she has asked for your advice. So we're giving some advice. And then, you know, when we look at the uh, bullet points, we can also see some other, let's say, secondary motives, some secondary purposes for writing. But the main purpose here is to give some advice, um, to give some information, arguably as well, to give some help. So we've got informal, we've got advice. The next thing we can do is consider a plan. So anybody that's seen the task one general training course on Udemy knows how I suggest planning with uh, task one general training. And it's ideally to spend just a couple of minutes, not long at all. So for each bullet point, uh, and by the way, I'm going to skip over here. No, actually, no, I'm not. Let's think about the keywords here, because I think it isn't. There are some keywords here that are quite easy to miss if you don't underline them or highlight them. So maybe people can tell me what are some of the key words or key expressions in the task. Yep. Yeah, so camping holiday is important. Anything else? Oh, let's put this in a highlighted form. Summer first time disadvantages. Good, good, good. Let's do all that. So first time. And this summer, the summer could be quite important as well. Maybe it will influence how we talk about the weather, for example. Um, and of course, we've got advice. We've written that down already, but good also to just put that underline in an underlined language or highlighted language. Uh, and what about in the bullet points? Anything? We've got disadvantages, somebody said. 
And notice the possible word here. I think that word possible is quite important. They're not definitely going to happen. We might have to talk about things that might go wrong rather than will definitely go wrong. Um, possible disadvantages, why they would enjoy. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. The bullet points, I wouldn't worry too much about underlining or highlighting because usually they're so direct that you won't miss anything. But sometimes maybe there will be something. I think these particular bullet points are so direct that we shouldn't really miss anything in them. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, you know, if you feel like you'd, it would be helpful to write something down, maybe like enjoy or whatever, maybe highlight that, then fine. But really when it comes to task one in the general training and underlining or highlighting keywords, it's, the, it's that main part at the top that contains some of the details that are quite easy to miss. So that's where you really should be focusing your attention when it comes to highlighting. Then when it comes to the plan itself, what we want to do is ideally, and again, this is, this is up to you. This is the way that I go about this. I try and write down two ideas per bullet point. I don't write them. I don't, I'm not writing them in a way that I give a lot of detail or full sentences. I just don't want to be writing and then run out of what to say. So having two ideas is quite useful. You might not use all of those ideas, but having two on the page on your plan means that you can focus on the writing. You won't waste time on generating ideas. So let's think about this. Why might your friend enjoy a camping holiday? There are no wrong answers here. Well, there might be some wrong answers, but there are there are many different right answers. Adventure, the beauty of nature, refreshments. Yeah, silence, great start to the year. Oh, Chitanya, why? So you've written great start to the year. Why would we not write great start to the year? Because it's summer, exactly. So that's an example of something that, it was a very good point. You know, a great start to the year. It might make a great start to the year if it wasn't summer. That's, the, that's underlining there the importance of keywords. Really easy mistake to make. Um, but yeah, it's a good example of why we need to underline those keywords. So yeah, I'm going to go with the nature argument. Um, and then maybe, let's say, so nature was one of the arguments. And then the other one I think was adventure. So nature and adventure could be quite useful. Oh, this reminds me, important point. We haven't actually underlined or highlighted all of the keywords. There's actually a keyword in that task up here that we haven't actually discussed. Um, has anybody identified it? Can anybody identify this other? Yes, Deepak's got it there. They're thinking of, it's not set in stone. And we have to treat it this way. We're not writing the letter to say, this is what you are going to face, but rather this is what you will face if you go. Notice that we've got an opportunity here to use conditionals uh, because of the wording of the task. So yeah, let's underline or highlight that one as well. Thinking of going. Right, let's get back into that plan. So we've got nature adventure for that first bullet point. Second bullet point, describe some possible disadvantages. I think somebody, some people have already kind of got involved here. Could be extremely hot in the summer. Yes, let's go with that. So very hot, very hot, obviously very simple vocabulary. We will improve that when we come to the paragraph. For now, we're just getting ideas down. Uh, mosquitoes, stress out, allergy, expensive. Oh, I would say expensive is probably, I would think it would be the opposite with camping. It's usually quite a low cost activity. Um, maybe one of the advantages you could mention why you would enjoy a holiday. Now, as somebody who does a, a fair bit of camping myself, I sympathize a lot with, uh, who said it, Egerman's idea, which is the idea of mosquitoes. Um, obviously, it depends where you are in the world, uh, but uh, mosquitoes, unfortunately, get into <laughs> many areas of the world. So we're going to just look at those two ideas, potentially mosquitoes and the fact it can be very hot. Uh, you may feel like we should look at more disadvantages, but notice that all we're asked for is more than one. We've got that plural S on the end there, but because of that, it's not enough to just write one disadvantage. If you write one disadvantage, you're not addressing the bullet points completely. So um, 
yeah, poison ivy, another uh, another idea there. Lots of different ideas you could come out with here. Just make sure you look at more than one, but don't feel like you need to look at three or more. Also, yeah, it could be very cold as well. But though again, summer, oh yeah, I suppose if you, as you say, Svetlana, if you're in the mountains, definitely a point to consider. Right, let's come to the final bullet point. Would you like to go camping with your friend this summer? And with this one, I want us to say no. I'm just going to put, uh, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm going to kind of control this response a bit more. I'm going to say no, but I want you to tell me reasons why we cannot rather than why we can. And I think the reason that I'm saying that is because it's sometimes easier to come up with excuses. Let's say you, you get to use some excuse language here. Yeah, for example, I've already been there. Maybe there's an office meeting. Maybe there's a wedding that I've got to attend or some sort of other event. You can use this really nice expression that you're, you're double booked or you would be double booked if you agreed to go, which means that you've agreed to do two things, which wouldn't be ideal. Double booked is quite useful. Um, I don't want to get double booked. I have, you know, um, an important meeting that I have to attend or travel with family, you know, my own family holiday to attend. Um, again, just a couple of key words here that just will generate some ideas for us when we get to that paragraph so that we don't have to waste time thinking of ideas when we reach it. Now, that is all we need. Very, very different to a task two essay plan, but it's really all we need when it comes to task one. And then we can jump straight into the writing itself. I'm just going to come up with a name here. It's a friend. So we don't need to write Mr. or Mrs. or dear sir or madam or whatever, any of that stuff. We can just use their name. Uh, let's go with Helen. It's the first name that comes to mind. Um, of course, if it's a name that has a shorter form, for example, Matt is short for Matthew, feel free to use the shorter form or the longer form. It doesn't really matter. People like being called different things. Uh, but just remember, you don't have to use surnames. So dear Helen, now this first sentence could be very important. And in a in, in an informal letter, the first sentence typically features some important words. Yeah, you can use non-English names absolutely fine. No problem with that whatsoever. How could we start this letter? Consider here, before you answer this question, consider the chain of correspondence. Consider whether you are the first one writing or whether you are writing back. That can make a difference to how you start your letter. This is why maybe we should have highlighted this as well. Good, Bilal. That's exactly the sort of thing that I want to hear. I want to hear this. It's great to hear from you. It's good to hear from you. I'm glad to hear from you. That sort of stuff. Uh, personally, if I were writing this, I would just say uh, it was great to hear from you. Or even better, we can be very informal and omit the subject and the verb and just say great to hear from you and then maybe put in a time reference. Let's imagine it was last week. Now this shows the examiner that you understand the context, that you understand that this person has asked for your advice. Well, it might not have even been a letter. It might have been a phone call. It might have been a text. It might have been an email, whatever it was. But we know that we've been asked for advice. So it was great to hear from you last week. Uh, great to hear from you last week. Uh, so we could end that with an exclamation mark. Now, something I point out in the lectures is you must only, or sorry, you should never use uh, exclamation marks in a, in a formal letter. And I would strongly recommend against them in a semi-formal letter, but in, a, in an informal letter, great. Um, now, what we can do here is actually we can remove the exclamation mark and add an and, I'm adding a comma before an and because these are two different parts of the sentence. Now I want you to reference that the, the actual content of the task. I want now to reference this idea of a camping holiday. This is our opening sentence. We're not gonna go into detail. We're not looking at the first bullet point yet. We just want to reference this idea of a camping holiday. So let's give you a little bit of a gap fill, let's say.
pay your da 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 da. What might go in these gaps here? Pl planning to the, planning to the, would that really work? Thinking the, there's only one word here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help give you a, a bit of a helping hand. Beginning with C, it is a verb, you're right, and it will finish with ing, so it's good to see that. Considering, good Svetlana, that's the only word here that can really fit. So you're considering the, Now, what's this about? Which idea are we talking about? Close Bilal. Yes, exactly. As Doreen has put there, we want that with an ING on the end. The camping trip. Now, there's something very subtle but very important going on in this sentence, in the end of this sentence. It's a very, very minor word, but it makes a big difference. It is the article. It is the definite article. Why am I using the definite article here? Now, considering formal, informal, doesn't really carry a formal or informal, um, let's say, uh, connotation to it. So you can be either. It's already been mentioned exactly, Hanan. So the friend knows which camping trip we're talking about because they mentioned it. So many, many candidates will write a camping trip. And it is true they're considering a camping trip. But when you add the, it creates, let's say... A much more personal vibe to the letter. It's like this is something that we both know about. There's, as Hanan's put there, there's common knowledge. So it's not it's not wrong to use the indefinite article, but it's better to use the definite article uh, because it kind of you know expresses this shared knowledge that you have, which is good for the relationship. So and you might even add a adjective in here. You could say that you're considering the big camping trip you know it's maybe a sort of a shared joke between you that it's a big adventure um so adding the adjective big is a very basic adjective but that doesn't matter it expresses again that you've you've got this shared knowledge here um now now let's put the exclamation mark uh, again it expresses you know just a strong emphasis of happiness or surprise or etc you know it should uh, be clear why the exclamation mark is useful here so let's read that out dear helen great to hear from you last week and even better to hear that you're considering the big camping trip that repetition of here is important we wouldn't want to change it it has this sort of mm, it has a, a nice flowing sound to it sometimes repetition is useful in that sense it's the same here and notice that we've also omitted the subject and the verb it is even better to hear, just like what we did up here, we omitted the subject and the verb. And again, over here, uh, we omitted the subject and the verb. You would not do this if you were writing an essay, but you can do this when you're writing an informal letter. Can we use no instead of here? Um, no, uh, no doesn't sound natural here. Very difficult to say why. Um, I suppose you're hearing it from somebody else. No just doesn't seem like an appropriate context, uh, this particular sentence. But here, you've heard it from your friend. That's fine. Don't worry about the repetition. Sometimes it's on purpose. So we've got that out the way. We can now um, move on to the next sentence. Notice here that I haven't made it very clear that I'm going to give advice. There's a reason for that. And that is because the, 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 the friend knows you're about to give advice. They've asked for some advice. You're writing back to them. You're obviously going to give them some advice, and that's going to come very become very clear in the next paragraph. For now, in an informal letter, you just want to say it's good to hear from you, kind of like how some informal letters just begin, "I hope you're well," and then you move on to the the next paragraph. Can we skip the word "and"? Great to hear from you last week. Um, you could, but I would then feel like you have to end the sentence and start again. I don't think it works to remove the and here. I think you need it if you want to keep it within the same sentence. Now, let's move on into the next paragraph. Now, first of all, how do you think we could begin this? Well, do you think this camping trip is a, uh, a good thing?
you sort of implied this at the beginning here, because bear in mind here, you don't need to be very strongly, I suppose you do if you if you are getting invited. No, I'm not sure. You don't actually have to definitely say it's a good thing, but I think we should. So as I know already, so good, come out. I like what you've got there. I already know you're a nature lover. I want to, well, I want that to appear a little bit later. First off, first off, sounds like we're starting a list a little bit too quickly. I think we need to provide some context here. So I'm going to, so in fact might be okay. Let me tell you why I believe that. I suppose that's okay. Sounds a little bit unnatural. This is the this is the really difficult thing about informal letters, kind of creating this natural tone to the letter, something that you would expect to read as a native speaker. Um, I appreciate that you consider me uh, for advice. You probably say something more along the lines of, uh, "It was it was it was nice to hear that you look you were looking to me for advice." But I'm going to start like this, and I'm good again. I'm going to see if I can get you to fill in a gap for me here. Personally, I think camping is a... Now, this very clearly responds to the advice. First of all, the advice of whether she should go at all. What kind of idea? Now, I want to see an adjective that's natural, but I also want to see one that's a little bit more advanced. So better than good. Better than great. Better than... Okay, let's see what we got here. Now, this is nice. So hopefully everybody's looking at the chat now because we've got some excellent adjectives coming up. Adventurous idea, splendid idea. I like that one. Excellent, refreshing, great. I like Hanan's actually. Terrific. Let's go with terrific. But there are a lot of good options here. But don't overdo this. Don't be too... Maybe tremendous is good as well. Um, but yeah, try to do better than good I, or even better than great as well. It's a good opportunity to show. Suitable is a little bit too... It's not, it's not uh, positive enough. It's like it's an acceptable idea. That just sounds like it's borderline satisfactory. Um, but ter terrific is a good one to go for. Right, so somebody said earlier that uh, they're a nature lover. I think that's a really good way to go. Before we get there, I'm going to give an opportunity, give us an opportunity to use a, a conditional sentence. Now, I'm going to add another comma and and. Again, I'm separating this part of the sentence. Notice the comma here as well. What might I be going for here? I want to use not only a conditional, but I want to use a comparative as well. What might go in here? Quite a simple word. That good. So Svetlana, you've got the second side of it as, but then I want an adjective. Yeah, Ishad's got it there as well. Now notice, so some of you um, may be, find that kind of uh, sentence construction a bit challenging, but it's definitely easier than you think it is. So you've just got this uh, first side of either, we don't know yet, either a zero conditional or a first conditional. So if I know you as well as, so you've got a comparative in there as well, as I think I do, there's a lot going on, lots of eyes. If I know you as well as I think I do, what's going to happen? Is she going to enjoy it? Is she going to love it? Is she going to have a good time? Tell me and think about the ending. Think about the grammar on the second side, on the result clause. Good, that's what I want to see from Hanan and Victor. The important thing is there, there is you've got the will and the infinitive. So you'll have, a, you'll have great fun. You'll have a good time. Now notice, however, that what, uh, what I'm seeing a, uh, a few times here is you and will. Chaitanya has got a nice idea there of contracting. You are going to, you're going to. It's okay to use the going to, it, it can work as well. I prefer to see the, uh, the, the will, but ideally we want to contract the subject with will. So you'll, if I know you as well as I think I do, you'll, let's say, yeah, you'll, you'll have great fun. You're going to have an amazing time. Uh, you'll absolutely love it. Lots of different expressions you could have here. And maybe as well, we can just add an I'm sure. 
Now notice that the I'm sure, that's not, that's not the result itself. The result is here. So it's, it's still okay. We're just saying, I'm sure you'll have great fun. Fun, sorry, fun. Uh, and if I know you as well as I think I do, I'm sure you'll have great fun. Now, the point of writing, if I know you as well as I think I do, you can then have the opportunity to offer some characteristics about that person and why it would then work. So now we can start to bring in this idea of nature. So to, how could we describe the person and kind of say it in a way that stresses that you, you're very good friends with them. You've been friends for years. How could you, how could you express this? So for somebody who said earlier, you're a nature lover, how could we improve this to kind of deepen that friendship? How could we say that, uh, that we're really good friends? How do we know this about that? Yeah, I, that's the sort of thing I'm going for, Harsh. Since you've always been close to nature, since you've always been a bit of a nature lover, that sort of thing is what I'm looking for here. So let's go with that. Um, since you've always been... And his, yeah, this is a nice little expression that you can use, also pretty useful for the speaking exam, uh, a bit of a. So it just sort of softens it a little bit. You're not saying she's extremely into nature, but she definitely loves or likes nature. Since you're a bit of a, since you've always been, and notice as well, you've got that present perfect, which is really useful. You're uh, introducing some grammatical range. Since you've always been a bit of a, sorry, a nature lover. Not necessarily, Egerman. I know that's a, it's a, it's a good point to bring up, but so a lot of people love going out hiking and for walks and all that sort of stuff and just love being around nature without actually doing the camping. Some people are limited in how much camping they can do or don't have the money for the gear, that sort of thing. So it's possible to love nature and not do camping. I think that's okay here. Um, could you write nature lover instead? Uh, one of those awkward <laughs> hyphen questions. Honestly, these things always confuse me, but uh, here... I probably would say no. It doesn't look natural to me to add a hyphen here. I'd have to look that up afterwards though, to be honest, maybe do a little bit of research on that. You typically would use hyphens for adjectives more often, but um, yeah, maybe you could get away with it. We'll have a look later. So since you've always been a bit of a nature lover, or how about this? Since you've always been a bit more, another comparative, more of a nature lover than, here's a good challenge for you. What noun goes after city this is tricky actually it begins sl you may have heard of this term it's a bit idiomatic you can just say a city person but here's an opportunity city slave that wasn't what i was thinking of but i suppose that could work dweller is another option here's the one i'm going for it may be beyond you a city slicker a city slicker a slightly contemptuous term. It's not necessarily a positive thing, but somebody who lives and works in the city spends a lot of time in urban environments. Again, just an opportunity to show your vocabulary. So since you've always been a bit more of a nature lover than a city slicker, um, we'll just quickly maybe consider how we would end this. Uh, let's say camping. We'll give you the what to what that side of yourself the chance good and what might go here or the opportunity both are okay to discover explore good i was thinking of a different one beginning with e starting with em embrace well done so explore is also okay discover is also okay but embrace you know, you're sort of accepting it and you're living it. It's, it's good. It's a nice positive word there, a bit more advanced. Since you've always been a bit more of a nature lover than a city slicker, camping will give you the chance to embrace that side of yourself. But you could also use explore, as I said. Now we want one more. So how can we add another point? And try to do it in an informal way. Yeah, you could also say that other side of yourself as well. How do we add another point? Yeah, also. So Ragaman is a relatively simple one, but it's better in a way than using moreover 
or furthermore or in addition because those sound a bit stuffy they sound a little bit too sophisticated they're good for essays and and uh, formal uh, letters but not so much for the informal letters so also now nice and simple let's keep this uh, sentence relatively short how can we refer to the adventure I think, I think what we've written so far here, Deepak, implies that it's their first time. Um, you know, when we're writing this, if we're giving advice about it, about what it's like, um, then it's that, that in itself implies that it's the first time. So maybe actually first time was less of a keyword than maybe we thought at the beginning, because it kind of comes through naturally anyway. Um, also, your experience would be something you'll never forget. Good. Let's, in fact, you've got harsh, you've, uh, the adventure. Let's just write the adventure will be something you'll never forget. Although what's good to see here is you've got that contraction, which is what I want to see when I see an informal letter. Um, especially if you're going to use contractions in one place, it's good to be consistent with them and use them throughout. Um, yeah. Adrenaline addict, not really an expression. Adrenaline rush is an expression, but it might be a bit too strong for camping. When I think of adrenaline rush, I think of extreme sports. I think of bungee jumping and, you know, whitewater rafting, not sort of sleeping out under the stars. I think adrenaline rush is probably a bit too strong for this activity. Uh, anyway, I think this is fine. Also, the adventure will be something you'll never forget. You could maybe use an exclamation mark here as well. You could not use one. That's really up to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it out here, but it's an option. Now, we want to move on to some contrast. How can the next paragraph begin, considering that we're going to move from positive to negative? Good. Having said that, and that is an example of one that is a bit more informal. Another one that you could use as well is that said. That said. It kind of means it is, it is the same thing as having said that. It's just another way of saying it. So having said that or that said, although is a conjunction, a subordinating conjunction. It doesn't work in the same way as a cohesive device like this. We have to make it part of a sentence. But with having said that, we can end after a comma and then we can carry on. Now, I want to give you a gap fill here. What might this be? An idiom that you, you probably will have seen before. Not pleasure, not pleasant. Um, I'll give you a bit more of a hint. I'll fill in the first word. Maybe some of you haven't seen this. This might be new to you. It's not savage. Think about boats. Yes, Hanan, good. Plain sailing. If something is plain sailing, it means it's comfortable, it's easy, it's no problem. It's a, it's a walk in the park is another idiom um, that you could use. So camping isn't a walk in the park. Camping isn't all plain sailing. We often use plain sailing with all, quite useful. But yeah, plain sailing just means very, very easy um, and enjoyable, pretty much. Um, no, nah, walk in the park is an idiom, so it doesn't need to be in quotes. Kind of like plain sailing, it's an idiom, it doesn't need to be in quotes. It is not a quote, uh, so we don't need to put it in quote marks. So having said that, camping isn't all plain sailing. That's a great way of introducing this contrast and then introducing what the paragraph is going to be about. There's a very clear purpose, there's strong coherence and cohesion. Uh, cakewalk, <laughs> yeah, you might be able to use that one as well. Never heard of five finger exercise, personally. Uh, maybe that's an expression I just haven't heard before. But plain sailing is, is definitely common enough that the examiner will know about it. How do we carry on? So we're going to introduce two points. Yeah, there are a few things to consider would be good in that first sentence. But let's keep this relatively short. Let's just start with the, somebody said it earlier, first off. Um, a good way to just introduce some listing language that's not too formal, it's okay. So first off, you should consider. Or we've got consider above, so how about we use a nice expression 
Oh, I think Doreen has added it up above, hasn't she? Yes, exactly. And Svetlana has added it there as well. You should keep in mind, it's very useful to add. So you should keep in mind, Tan Tanuja, notice that it's singular rather than plural with mind. So you should keep in mind that it can get. Now, can we make this a little bit better than very hot? Very hot maybe is a little bit basic on the vocabulary. Scorching, but then we these sound a little bit overdone as well. Um, maybe we just change it around a bit. That the temperature can become, let's say, sunny, harsh, harsh, crazy. This can, <laughs> you can say like crazy hot. This is super informal, by the way but it's not a problem because it's up to you how you write your informal letter. It's up to you what you how you uh, represent the friendship uh, with the person that you're writing to. So it's okay to write crazy hot. Um, so that's fine. Let's, let's, let's go with that in the summer. Um, so, and then I want to add something here. You should keep in mind that the temperature can become crazy hot in the summer. And when camping, you're constantly exposed to now, what might be here? This means the weather, but all aspects of the weather. It begins with L. Think about, uh, think about chemistry. Maybe that's a, not the best. Yes, Tanuja has got it there. Elements and Pratishka as well and Urshad. So if you're exposed to the elements, that's a nice colloquial way of talking about the weather. Um, if you're exposed to the elements or if you're out in the elements. Um, we often use that when we talk about just being outside uh, and not having the correct equipment like um, a waterproof coat or a, you know, a sufficiently waterproof tent and things like that. So... And when camping, you're constantly exposed to the elements. What else? No, no need for any adjective before elements. In fact, that I would strongly recommend against adding an adjective before elements. The elements is like a set phrase, I suppose, just to mean the weather. But how can we add the next point about mosquitoes? as well consequently on top of that yeah let's go with on top of that i'm glad to not see secondly i feel like secondly would be a bit too formal a little bit too listing so on top of that is fine um what kind of conjunction you're making i'm not sure so yeah we just want to add another point that's the uh the cohesive device that we want here so on top of that how do we add how do we talk about the mosquitoes what could we say at night yeah you'd be specific about the time of day yeah okay let's go with the aware of you should be aware the constant bombardment of mosquitoes at night is quite unpleasant well there we go harsh you're just giving me an entire line that we could definitely use here just make sure to use an article before bombardment because you've got a the noun of noun unit of language so you need a the the constant of uh so, so the constant bombardment lovely language there of mosquitoes at night this it can be quite unpleasant now notice here the opportunity to use another conditional it can be quite unpleasant if you don't have now what do you use to keep mosquitoes away i was thinking yeah i was thinking more repellent yeah so notice the spelling here repellent repellent now you could say mosquito repellent um but because we know we're talking about mosquitoes you don't actually need to add the word mosquito 
the context is clear enough. So on top of that, the constant bombardment of mosquitoes at night can be quite unpleasant if you don't have repellent. Again, another opportunity where you could add an exclamation mark. You don't want to be too serious about this. You're kind of just expressing, look, it's important to go and buy some repellent so that you have a good time. Um, and it's not necessary. So if somebody, again, so Deepak, if somebody's going camping for the first time, it might not be obvious to them that the mosquitoes come out mostly at night, um, uh, which does tend to be the case, or at least if they don't come out at night, you're stuck in one place at night trying to sleep. So that's, that's something to consider. You could definitely remove that from the sentence and it would still be fine. Um, it's up to you. Depends whether you think it's valuable enough. I don't think it really matters, but it's in there. So let's finish by going into the final paragraph where we're saying whether we'd like to go camping. Now, again, this paragraph is important to consider that we have been sent a letter beforehand or we've been told of an invite beforehand. So you make that clear in the way that we open the paragraph. What do we do, what do we typically do when we're invited or when we get an invite and we can't go? Is the, fir is the first thing we do say no or do we do something before we say no? Yeah, we might say I am sorry even before the sorry, though, there's something that we can do before we say sorry. We could say thank you. We can say thank you for the invite, but I'm sorry that I can't go. Uh, and again, that indicates that we have received that invite in the past. So we can either say thank you for the invite or we can say something like this. It was so kind of you to invite me along. And then we don't need to say invite me camping. The along, the context is clear enough, that's fine. So it was so kind of you to invite me along, uh, but it's so kind of you to invite me along, let's say, but the dates, and you could say date singular, or you can say date plural here, it doesn't really matter. There's gonna be multiple days that they're away, so dates are also fine. But the dates, what could we say about the dates? The dates, so as I was saying there, Victor, you could use it in the singular, you can use it in the plural, a little bit more colloquial to use it in the plural, but notice that the date is going to be on multiple days. So the sixth, the seventh and the eighth, you're going camping. So in that sense, you can use it. The dates aren't, fa yeah, they're not convenient would be better. They aren't, yeah, and then maybe we'll soften it a bit with a quite. They aren't quite convenient or they aren't. Maybe we could say something like the dates. Uh, here's, here's a nice expression. The dates are a bit awkward for me. Because, as Carlos puts there, I'm double booked. Oh, I don't want to be double booked. You're not double booked yet, but you wouldn't want to be double booked if you ended up agreeing to this invite. The dates are a bit awkward uh, for me because I don't want to be double booked um, since, so because I, now tell me what you're doing at that time. I don't think we need both of these. I think we can just go with one. So what do we want? The family holiday or the meeting? And how do we write it? Okay, we're more happy with the meeting. Well, we're happier with the meeting. Let's go with that. Since I, let's say I am likely to have an important meeting at a uh, week or something like that, you know. But yes, as Bilal says, you know, you could also say I'm likely, it, it is my brother's we wedding. So likely to have, you could use with meeting. If it were a wedding, a wedding is likely to be more set in stone in the calendar, so I wouldn't use likely with, with wedding. Uh, yes, Kaori, you could also say, I might have a meeting. The, I went with likely just because I wanted to stress, you know, that higher possibility, it's a higher percentage, whereas might is more like a 50-50 and you might be able to get away with going on the holiday. So yeah, but you could say might, that would be okay. How do we end this letter now? Yeah, with love. What we could do here, I mean, let's have a look at the word count. I'm not actually sure how we're doing on that. We, it may already be quite long. 
Oh, let's get this out of the way. 173. So yeah, we probably should be closing that up now. Um, what I would do is just say, I hope you have a fantastic time. Make it more specific to the letter rather than a take care or a best or with love. That's fine, but you're not really taking in the context of the letter. It's still okay. It depends on the letter really. But with this one, this would be great. And then maybe you can have the sort of love or, you know, um, best or, you know, whatever you want here. We'll take care. And then your name at the end there. Um, but yeah, Pratishka, like you said there, uh, and you, you might say, um, I hope to hear all about it. I hope to, or I look forward to hearing all about it as well. I'm just considering the time aspect here. It's already kind of long. Uh, so we're just going to add, I hope you have a fantastic time at the end there. Um, and I look forward to hearing all about it if you've got the time. So there's our task one and uh, the word count there, 182 words, not so bad at all. As I've said before, with task one, we try and keep it under 200 if possible. Um, and I think that's pretty decent. So well, we've got 10 minutes, not really that much time to uh, look at my other letter, but we'll do what we can within the 10 minutes. Um, see what we can get done. With this one, we are looking at a... Uh, yeah, this is general training, Darina. So this is uh, these are all general training tasks, task one. And this one's a formal letter, as Urshad's put there. And we can see it's very quickly. A museum near your home is looking for people to do part-time voluntary unpaid work. You'd like to do some voluntary work at the museum. Write a letter to the museum director to apply for the voluntary work. In your letter, explain why you want to do voluntary work at the museum. Describe some skills and qualities you have that would be useful. Give details of when you would be available for work. So we're going to go through this one double time. So formal letter. And it's a job application letter. Again, this one should be relatively obvious. So our plan. Now, the number of times they've written part time, they're voluntary unpaid. They've written it three times. I think it's, we don't even need to worry about highlighting that keyword. It's very obvious. Um, the teacher advised me to stop using the verbs is RB. I, I, uh, so Bilal, that's, that's a very strange question, not from you, but from your teacher. I don't know how you could survive in English without using the to be verb. <laughs> it's just not possible. Um, so that's very odd. No, don't worry about that at all. Continue using to be. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of crazy to me. I'm not sure where you heard that. Um, yes, Hanan. Uh, in fact, I might leave this one for people. I, I, I'm, I don't want to rush this and we only have about 10 minutes left. Mm, does anybody have any important questions about this particular task here? I would harsh. I'm going to do what I can. I just want to check if anybody has any questions. Hanan, you've mentioned that you have a question. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to say that the opportunity has now passed. So let's go on to this one. So how are we going to begin this? We're going to think about a plan very quickly. Why do we want to do the, um, the, 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 Voluntary work. What reason do we want to do it? Okay, that's a nice one. Give back to the society or the community that you grew up in. Good. I'm going to do this one with just one point on each one. We'll see if we can expand it as we go again, just because of the time. What some skills we have that might be useful? Being a history lover could actually, I suppose, go into either one, couldn't it? It could be about why you want to work there, and it's also a quality that you have. Um, yeah, so let's say you've got management skills, communication. Notice this. This could be a quality in a sense. You live near to the museum. That could be something to talk about as well, which also takes into account some of the key aspects of the task. So I'm just going to add to this one here as well. Near to museum. So you'd be punctual. And uh, we'll add one more, let's say, management skills. Fine. And give details of when you'd be available. Now with this one, not sure whether you um, can really put down ideas. You just kind of put down some dates, really, wouldn't you? I'm free. So notice that it's not just when you will be available 
on, on your first starting date. But yes, as Harsh says, you it's, you know, whenever you're available. I can do Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, for example, and my earliest starting date. So we'll do that. So earliest date, let's say is the fourth. And then from that point onwards, I can do, uh, let's say weekends, something like that. Now, there we go. So let's jump into this here. I haven't gone on with the uh, highlighting keywords here just because of the time, but ideally I'd want you to do that if you were in the exam. Now, dear who? So Victor, I think you can get away with the earliest date. You can say a, a specific date for the earliest and then you can use like every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So dear sir or madame, dear sir or madame. So this is up to you here. You can say dear sir or madame. You could also, if you wanted to, give the actual name which would suggest that you've looked into who is the director at the museum. So it might be like Mrs. Jones or Mr. Sharp or whatever. It's up to you, really. Uh, this will just uh, change, obviously, how you end the letter, but we'll come to that later. And I think most of you know, sir or madame, yours faithfully, somebody's name, use yours sincerely. Uh, now, how could we begin this one? It's going to be quite different to how we began the other one. I assume extra information I'm writing to. Yes, so I'm writing. I am writing. Keep this nice and simple. I am writing to to do what? Consider the type of letter that it is. Keep it relatively, maybe a bit shorter. You don't want to go too long. I am writing to express my interest. You can just go straight into I am writing to apply for the pos yeah you could go with that as well i'm writing with respect to the advert that i've seen recently this is all important there are a couple of key things that you want to do in your purpose letter to a job application letter you start by mentioning the position that it is i am writing to apply for the position of part-time volunteer so make sure you've got those both in there. So it's not just important it's part time and it's not just important that it's voluntary, but both of those are important. So the position of part time volunteer, you could also say the part time position of volunteer. It doesn't matter. Uh, Irshad, go with with regard to with regards to is commonly used as well. Um, and it can be seen as a regional variant, but regard is technically accepted as the uh, as the appropriate way to go. Um, I'm writing to apply for the position of part-time volunteer at the, now let's just make something up. And then we add where we found it. There's a, like a, a local newspaper that I've just made up, but that's where you're likely to see something. I'm writing to apply for the position of part-time volunteer at the Bristol Science Museum as advertised in the Bristol Herald. Nice and simple, no fluff in that uh, sentence, which is important. People who are going through job applications want to get straight to the point. Now, how do we start the next sentence? Explain why you want to do the involuntary, uh, the voluntary work. This is quite tricky. I think this is quite a tricky one to consider how you might start. I wouldn't use a cohesive device here. I think I'd just jump into... Let's say your background. You're saying you want to give back to society. As a keen to begin with. So these expressions, I feel like they're going to be a bit out of place here. I think you may need to take the initiative and write something a little bit more direct for this one. Um, so something like. Since the museum has been a. I want you to reference your history, your background. What does the museum mean to you? A great source of help, an integral part of the culture. Language like this is great. You know, it's a good opportunity. How about we go with, since the museum has been an in, that, in something, source of something, let's say knowledge, yeah. 
So knowledge and learning. Learning as a noun here, not as a verb. Invaluable, good. So there you go. Notice it's not unvaluable, but invaluable. Has the Cincinnati Museum has been an invaluable source of knowledge and learning um, during my life. Ooh, that doesn't sound right. I want to say this. I want to say since my childhood, but I don't want to write since twice. There are different meanings of the word since, but let's just go with as, I think. As the museum has been an invaluable source of knowledge and learning since my childhood, what? I now want to, what do you want to do? Now, this is where you can use a little bit of the language from the plan, which is what the purpose of the plan is. I want to give back what would you add here? What could you add here? I want to give back You wouldn't give it back. Good, Svetlana's got it there. You just say something back. This is an expression that we often use. You want to give something back, whether that's your time or your money. Something is the more common expression here. So I now want to give something back by what do you want to do? volunteering what are you volunteering so you can volunteer something this can work as a transitive verb you can add an object at the end yeah my time good um and you might say my time and expertise um as well just to give a little bit more vocabulary i now want to give something back by volunteering my time and expertise um let's give something back as a museum, maybe we could say give something back to the Institute by volunteering my time and expertise. Uh, I wouldn't say as a curator, because curator is such a professional term, uh, which you know obviously requires a lot of training and a specific degree probably to, to do that. It wouldn't be right to say curator. You are a, a volunteer is going to be quite different. Somebody that shows people around the museum, maybe rather than curates the exhibitions. Yeah, you might work alongside the the curators in the museum potentially. Um, okay, so is that enough? We're going to make it enough for now. We may come back and add something here, but let's go to the next paragraph describing the skills and qualities. This is an opening sentence when you can illustrate your skills and qualities. Not ah, so Hanan has it there. Excel. I believe I would excel in this voluntary position for the what reasons? I want to express that they're about to they're about to appear. Because you could say for various reasons and for numerous reasons, but for the following reasons. Because of that definite article, that's why we need the following. I believe I would excel in this voluntary position for the following reasons. Now you've got an opportunity to use listing language, such as. For a starter would be informal, Hanan. I wouldn't use um, for a starter in a formal letter. Firstly is fine. So firstly. Uh, firstly, what? Yeah, that one's a bit more informal, uh, a bit more informal. And you probably say for starters as well, rather than for a starter, for starters, if it's an informal letter. So firstly, because I what? I what? There you go. Let's go with that. Because I reside near the museum. I think, hmm, why doesn't reside look right to me? Hard to say, I reside. It just seems a little bit odd. I don't know why, sometimes it's hard for me to say, but live, although it's the more basic verb, um, I think it's more appropriate here. Just pretty tricky though to say exactly why. For, uh, because I live near the museum, I would, now here we can bring in this language. Yet yeah, you might say, because I live just around the corner, or again, that sounds a, it's just maybe a touch informal, but you could say, because I live within a 
10 minute drive or 10 minute walk even of the museum, I would, well, you might say you could rely on me to always be punctual. Arguably, we should try to avoid using that second person pronoun. Um, but because it's a voluntary position, I don't think we need to be quite as concerned about being super sophisticated and formal with the language. I think it's probably okay just to use you. But if you want, if you know, if you're writing like a really professional job application letter, you might instead use the passive voice. I could be relied upon to, to always be punctual. Uh, it just sounds very stuffy, but you know, a proper job uh, application letter may, may need that. Um, yeah, the management could rely on me. <sighs> Not so keen on that. I think it's okay with this letter to write you. Um, so yeah, and count on Rita's good idea, but that phrasal verb count on is probably less formal than the more formal rely. Well, I suppose rely on is also a phrasal verb, really. You've got the on. For some reason, to me, it seems more formal than count on, though. Um, okay, so how could we carry on? You could rely on me to always be punctual. Another important trait, good. Another important, uh, let's say, quality that I can bring, that I could bring or would bring. Mm, what could we go for? There's another, a number of options here, and they all slightly mean a different thing. Another, in, let's go with would, just because we've got the would up here, that I would bring to this position. Bring to the table, nice expression, Urshad, but again, I would say it's a little bit colloquial, a little bit informal. Um, you might use it in a business meeting where you're talking, you're literally talking with your colleagues rather than writing to them. Uh, another important quality that I would bring to this position is my... Okay, we could say my great communication skills. I mean, I've got management skills here, but I think communication skills would be better just because we're in a museum. And if you think about the kind of qualities that a volunteer, that a volunteer at a museum needs, I would probably say communication skills are more important than management skills. The management skills are very useful if you're a manager, but as a volunteer, that's not likely. Communication skills are gonna be important, but then you can tell me why. Another important quality that I would bring to this position is my communication skills, um, which would, now notice the non-defining relative clause here, you're giving more information about the communication skills, you're telling the reader why they're important, which would uh, enable me to what? Hanan, just to get back to you on your question, idioms are good for informal letters. Um, they won't massively affect your score. Just make sure you get them right. And you can have formal idioms as well. Formal idioms do exist. Um, but yeah, it's more about which letter you're writing than about the idioms themselves. Would enable me to effectively communicate, interact, knowledge of history, serve your purpose, welcome the visitors. Yeah. All of these things, really, let's put them all in, which will enable me to um, help visitors better understand the exhibition. Sure, oh, no, you can tell me. Here, topic related vocabulary. What do you have at a museum? What word am I thinking of here? More specific to museums. Good, exhibitions. Good to see some good spelling there as well, which would enable enable me to help visitors better understand. I'm not sure I like that. Enable me to help with, no, that's okay, I guess, which would enable me to help visitors better understand the exhibitions. And then somebody said premises. Maybe we go with that, navigate the premises. And there you go. You've got skills, plural, qualities, plural. So you've, you've kind of met that requirement. Um, with that paragraph there. So we can move on to the final paragraph, give details of when you would be available for work. So how can we start this? Now this, this is a crucial paragraph. The way that you start this one is quite important. So a lot of people, if they're not so confident in letter writing, they can be a little bit too presumptuous here. You know, they'll be like, I'm available to start work. It's like, you're available to start work, but I haven't, you, I haven't given you the job yet. So you need to write in a way that 
acknowledges that you might not get this. So that's a good start, Victor, using the would instead of the will. We can do even better. If I get this job, that's probably what I would say to my friend at the pub. You know, if I get this job, I'm going to be so happy. A little bit too informal, though. What we can do here is we can use should inside a conditional rather than if. And by doing that, it becomes immediately a lot more formal. So should you wish to consider me? So it's not even saying that should I get the job, but it's should you even wish to consider it? You really want to play down your chances. This is I don't know why we do this, but it's just a very common thing that we do when we're writing job application letters. We're trying to be as humble as possible rather than arguably arrogantly assuming we're going to get it. So should you wish to consider me for this position? Or let's say consider me as a volunteer, just to avoid writing position again, although we do have volunteer a couple of times. Should you wish to consider me in this position or should you wish to consider me as a volunteer? Either one. But notice that you're, yeah, you're giving me... Um, a, keep in mind, Hanan, as they're reading this, they're already considering your application. So that kind of doesn't make sense. They're considering the application and reading it, but considering giving you the job, that's a different thing. Um, so it's better to, uh, to write, consider me as a volunteer. So should you wish to consider me as a volunteer? I, then you kind of give your times here. Mm, wouldn't use that, Carlos. Again, it's nice if you were maybe speaking to somebody, but it's a bit too presumptuous um, when writing a job application letter. I would like to. Don't say what you would like to do. You want to be very clear to with the reader. You want to say, this is when I'm available. Not I'd like to work, but this is when I would be available if you accepted me. So should you wish to consider me as a volunteer, I would be... Uh, let's say my my earliest available starting date would be, notice the would here, would be, let's say, I've got the 4th there, so Saturday, 4th of December. And then a nice expression that if you've taken the academic task one course, uh, this should be familiar. We can say after which to mean after this. So rather than starting a new sentence and saying after this, I can then work on these days, you can just do a comma, add after which, and then carry on. So it would be Saturday, 4th of December, after which I uh, would, or I would be available to work um, every weekend. Or you might say every Saturday and Sunday, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Let's go every, let's be more specific, every weekend, because we want to be as specific as possible here. What about times? So Carlos, yeah, you might be able to use language like that. Uh, you, you would say you, you could count on me to be a great and motivated volunteer. What times could we put in here? We'll keep it simple. Let's just maybe say from, so during the evening, Harsh, would be maybe good if we were talking, but we want to be more specific in a letter. So you would say something like from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., um, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., now, bear in mind, yeah, suppose you could do this. The most important thing here is you don't say that you can work too much. If you put too much, too many days here or too long a time, then it's no longer part time. It's a key part of the, S, uh, of the letter. So we have to make sure we're not adding too much. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. seems quite a lot for a part time position. I would prefer maybe then to see 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Then that's 12 hours in the week. Saturday and the Sunday, maybe that's maybe that's more in line what, what, with what we would expect. Um, yeah, Titania, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. also okay. Eight hours a week, definitely part time, particularly as a volunteer. Bear in mind as well, you know, we're not getting paid for this, so be a bit more realistic about what you could do. 
Um, so should you wish to consider me as a volunteer, my earliest available starting date would be Saturday, 4th of December, after which I would be available to work every weekend, 11 a.m. to, let's add a from there, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Just double check on the word count. Look at that, 150. Lovely stuff. So then we can just quickly close off with a closing sentence. What do we typically say at the end of a job application letter? Yes, Svetlana, you could talk about uh, flexibility as well. You might say, I would be available to work every weekend from 11 to 5 p.m. Um, with some flexibility, you might add as well. Thank you for your consideration. It's nice. And then, no, I don't think you need to explain why only weekends. It's typical that most people have free time on the weekends, so that makes sense. I look forward to hearing from you. I wouldn't say I look forward to hearing with a favourable response. Maybe this is just a personal thing, but I think you need to leave it in the hands of the manager. Um, you know, and you've got to take it, uh, the response as it comes. Just nice and simple. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for your consideration. I look forward to hearing from you. And well done, Pratishka. Yours faithfully, as we mentioned earlier, that's because... We have no name at the beginning. If we did have a name, it would then, of course, be yours sincerely. And then you want to actually add your name, full name, at the end. You can obviously make one up, um, but uh, yeah, as long as you've got a first name and a second name there, and you don't shorten the second name, ideally, unless everybody knows you as that. But as long as you've got the surname, that's the important thing. And then we can have a look at the full word count, 164. Lovely stuff. I think that's great. Um, so the important thing with this formal letter to keep in mind is just how you opened some of the paragraphs. And it's a little bit trickier with this one because there are not sort of template cohesive devices to look at. But some of these are very useful. For example, when you're opening a paragraph that asks about your qualities and skills and characteristics, this is very useful. I believe I would excel in this position, voluntary or otherwise, for the following reasons. And then opening the paragraph about availability dates, should you wish to consider me as a volunteer, and then my earliest available starting date. Language like this can be very useful. Um, at the weekends, on the weekends, at the weekends, at the weekends. To be honest, Ershad, they seem pretty much identical to me. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't bat an eyelid to use an, to use an idiom. I wouldn't bat an eyelid at either of those. They both sound okay to me. Um, I look forward to hearing that. I look forward to uh, Svetlana. It's, that's a good question. It's just letter language. Um, it's just we at no point really do we ever say I look forward to hearing from you. We never say it. We only write it. Uh, so you just need to remember it for the writing. It only appears in letters for whatever reason. It's an ing after the two. So just uh, remember it there. Uh, should we write how many weekends of our part time, like 12 weekends or how? Uh, you could do sharing. I don't think it's necessary. It's not, it's not an integral part of the task. So if you want to add it, that's okay, but don't waste your time on it at the same time. Oh, is that right, Hanan? Okay, so on the weekend is American, at the weekend is British. That much I did not know. So there's a, you know, it's a lesson even for me. Every day is a school day. Um, so anyway, let's, um, let's wrap this up here. Hopefully you guys have found this one useful. Um, I am going to have to wrap this up despite questions. If you have any more questions, please let me know in the Udemy q and really uh, would like you to ask in the Q&A rather than in the messages because then everybody can read 